John Searle is one of the most influential philosophers of the second half of the 20th century, renowned for his contribution to philosophy of mind and the philosophy of language. John, you have proposed terms such as biological naturalism and irreducible subjective ontology. Can we use these to marry dualism with materialism when we study consciousness? Okay, well, in the question, you say I'm trying to marry dualism with materialism, and what I'm trying to do is reject both. I think the problem with this whole subject is we have these obsolete categories of materialism and dualism and monism and all the rest of it. And I think that's the difficulty. You have to, if we didn't have this peculiar history, I think it would be much easier to see the solution to the problem. If we never had a history of God, the soul, and immortality, and if we just had a sort of scientific a view of the world, if we had our current science but without our, our current uh, ideological history, then I think people would think uh, it would be, seem perfectly natural to suppose that consciousness is a biological phenomenon along with digestion. I think that's the right attitude. It's, the difficulty is that there are two um, traditions that militate against that. One is the tradition of religion that says uh, God, the soul, and immortality are not part of the physical world. <laughs> Uh, and consequently, consciousness is not part of the physical world because it's, uh, it's the soul. It's uh, the feature of the soul. That's the Cartesian tradition. Now, there's another tradition that thinks it's opposed to that but accepts the worst assumptions. And that's the tradition of materialism uh, that says, well, consciousness is not a part of the physical world. They both make the same mistake. And I think the best is to get rid of the vocabulary of dualism and materialism and mental and physical and just state the facts. The facts are that there are these conscious processes and states. Uh, they have a certain uh, qualitative feel to them, that for every conscious state, there's something it feels like to be in that state. And consequently, they have what I call a first-person ontology, so they're different from other uh, features of the world, like uh, mountains and molecules, in that they only exist insofar as they're experienced by some I, by a first person, uh, by uh, some a subject, animal or human. Now, if we adopt that view, uh, that just seems to me a natural view. I call it naturalism. And if the right level to, to investigate consciousness is at the biological level as opposed to, say, the molecular level or the social level. So I've invented this artificial term, biological naturalism, to try to get out of the, traditional, of, of the traditions of dualism and materialism and all of that. Um, so that I came by this term biological naturalism because I discovered that people feel more comfortable if your view has a name, if you can call it, and I reject all the usual names of, of uh, materialism and uh, monism and dualism. So it's just let's treat consciousness as part of nature. The right level to investigate it is biological. And so a natural word for that seemed to be biological naturalism. I agree with you and I understand fully what you're saying in terms of Cartesian dualism and this kind of quality feel that we have with consciousness has been misinterpreted throughout history as being some kind of soul or consciousness independent hey. or of the yeah. brain and the mind. But if we're looking to define and reduce these qualitative experiences to a biological functioning, then can't we also reduce this biological functioning to materialism, as in it's a property of material a yeah. phenomena in the brain. So, if you like, it's a property of, of uh, the brain, uh, but it's not materialism in the traditional sense uh, because materialism in the traditional sense denies the existence of any subjective ontology, that anything that has a first person existence. And I think you just have to face up to the fact that conscious states are qualitative states of humans and animals. And maybe there are other forms of consciousness, but the kinds that we know are humans and animals, and we have to accept that that's irreducible. Now, why is it irreducible? Why can't we say, well, it, it, we'll get rid of it the way we have with uh, sunsets or, or uh, uh, rainbows? And the answer to that is that you can't make the reality illusion distinction for the very existence of consciousness, because if it consciously seems to you that you are conscious, then you are conscious. See, the illusion-reality distinction is a distinction between how things consciously seem. It seems like the sun is setting over the mountains, and how they really are. It really isn't setting over the mountains. But you can't do that distinction for the very existence of conscious states, because where their existence is concerned, if the illusion of being conscious, the conscious illusion of being conscious is consciousness. There, You can't make the illusion reality distinction. So consciousness is unusual among biological phenomena, but that doesn't make it any less biological. It's 
a feature of our biological life caused by brain processes and realized in the brain. You've just explained why it is called biological naturalism because it isn't reducing it down to a materialistic sense in a historical tradition, which makes perfect sense. Now, yeah. I'm assuming that at this point, how you're defining consciousness with this internal subjective ontology obviously relates to your biological naturalism. And I'm assuming does, at this yeah. point that this is also going to play into how you feel about the hard problem. Well, I, I, I think the expression hard problem is a, a misnomer. I mean, there's some debate about who mm-hmm. invented it. I think it was probably Galen Strawson. But there is a difficult problem in neurobiology, and that is to figure out exactly how it works. That is, what exactly are the neurobiological processes that cause conscious states? Now, I think uh, that the... Uh, there's no metaphysical hardness to the problem. It's just a very hard to investigate a, a system consisting of a hundred billion neurons and God knows how many synapses. Mm. And what makes it exceptionally difficult in the case of consciousness is it looks like you're going to have to identify global features of the brain because what the brain does is not create just this or that perceptual experience. It creates an entire conscious field. And most of the existing research is on specific modalities. So you you study gestalt switching, or you study uh, pains, or you study uh, uh, the blind side. You study specific sorts of uh, conscious experiences that people have. But the trouble with all that research uh, is that it goes on in patients that are already conscious, and we need to know how does the patient get the conscious field in the first place. So what I'm proposing is we shouldn't think of perception as creating consciousness, but as modifying a pre-existing conscious field. And the problem is to figure out how the brain creates the conscious field. Now, you might say, well, let's just let's get busy and do it. The difficulty is that the current research techniques either rely on imaging or they rely on single cell recordings. Those are the mo- there are others, but those are the most common research techniques. And neither of them gives us these global features that we need to get. We need to figure out how global features of the brain create a conscious field in the first place, which perception can then modify. And uh, the difficulty here is that our research techniques just aren't advanced enough for this. I mean, I think uh, we're getting better research techniques all the time, and as they develop, uh, we should be presumably be able to address the problem more directly than we can now. But now you, you touched upon the aspects of we have to go past perception and see what this, this consciousness is being experienced. And you believe that there is a unified conscious experience that we have internally. So there is a, like a, a Tony that I experience and there is a John that you experience. Can I just have some of your thoughts, say, against Dan Dennett's position of fame in the brain, which is... The, the unified you is a different kind of illusion, not the kind of illusion that you've just refuted previously five minutes ago, but a different kind of illusion of just different brain parts activating together and the one that wins out is the kind of experience you have in the morning. So when we get up in the morning we're, and we're supercharged with, with caffeine, we're alert versions of ourselves, but when we wake up in the middle of the night, half asleep, we're different versions of ourselves. So how do you feel about that perspective that says that even well, the unified experience isn't really you. Well, we uh, there's no question that uh, my ordinary waking experience, the kind I'm having right now, is unified in the sense that I don't just see the computer screen in front of me and hear the sound of my voice and feel the weight of my body against the chair, but I have all those simultaneously as part of a single field. Now, it's true, when I'm dreaming, uh, everything's become uh, uh, disordered in various ways. But all the same, even in dreams, uh, my dream is a single unified consciousness. It just doesn't have the uh, the uh, detailed features of normal waking consciousness. So I don't buy the story that uh, somehow or other we don't have a unified uh, conscious field. We do. It's our daily experience. Now, there are various illusions. Uh, so, for example... Um, uh, there are uh, various kinds of mistakes that we can make about the, uh, about uh, the character of our uh, conscious field. I mean, there is the uh, uh, various gaps in the experience that we don't detect, saccadic movement of the eyes and things like that. But there isn't any question that consciousness comes to us, uh, normal waking consciousness comes to us in unified conscious field. And the various details, like the details I'm perceiving now, uh, these are better thought of as modifications of the conscious field. Now, I, when the last time I read Dennett, he was denying the existence of any subjective consciousness. He thinks we're mistaken in thinking we have that. And I think that, frankly, his view, I think, is frankly preposterous. 
I'm kind of in between the two. I, I see exactly what you're saying. And there, even if there are remote parts of the brain working separately in different modalities, we're still experiencing a unified internal state. So even now, if I start drinking alcohol, I might become obviously less able to speak or concentrate, but I'm still experiencing a unified Tony that's going on right now. I mean, even even if you get drunk or uh, uh, you you ski so fast and you get in an ecstatic state, uh, all the same, you have all that as part of a unified conscious field. I do feel that Dennett's position is a bit too deterministic and I don't really think that everything consciously is an illusion, but he's obviously very reductive in that approach. But this, yeah. this leads perfectly onto my next subject for you, which is how what you've addressed so far, how this then relates to the problems and the definitions when we talk about free will in a contemporary academic environment. Yeah. Well, this is a big subject, and I'll say a little bit about it briefly. Now, most philosophers accept a view which I think is just beside the point. It's irrelevant, and that's compatibilism. They think that, yes, we do have uh, free will, but all our acts are still determined, and these are compatible because free will just means that you have um, acts determined by such things as your character and your deci- decision processing. Uh, I, I no doubt they're right that there is a use of free will, where if I do things of my own free will, all the same way they might turn out to be determined. But that's not the philosophically interesting question. The philosophically interesting question is, are there cases of action where the antecedent causes of the action were not sufficient to determine that particular action, were not sufficient to fix that action? They were not causally sufficient. And that's the uh, crucial question about free will. Are there cases where when I'm making up my mind to do something, I genuinely have a choice among alternatives. And what that means is that the causes of my action were not at that point sufficient to fix one alternative rather than another. That's the meaningful question of free will, and that is not solved by just saying, well, there are these. There's a use of the word free, where if you say he did it of his own free will, it might still be the case that he was determined. That's beside the point. So I think there's a serious question about this. Now, it depends on consciousness, because the only cases where we do have this experience that we act uh, in such a way that our experience is not fixed by the preceding causes, I call that the experience of the gap. There's a causal gap between our sense of the cause of our action and our actually deciding to do something. And uh, we uh, these are features of our conscious experience. So uh, the problem of free will is part of the problem of consciousness. Now, we just don't know enough about the, uh, how the brain produces consciousness or how consciousness functions to know whether or not we do, in fact, have free will. Are there, in fact, such actions? Uh, but here's an odd peculiarity, and that is even if we become convinced that we don't have free will, we still have to continue to act as if we did have free will because we cannot engage in rational decision-making except on the presupposition of free will. If I go into a restaurant and they, I'm given a choice of things to eat, I can't say, well, I'm a determinist. I'll just wait and see what I decide or wait and see what happens. Even that only makes sense to me if I think of it as my saying that as part of a free, rational decision-making process. That is, the refusal to exercise free will is only intelligible to us as an exercise of free will. Uh, Otherwise, I wouldn't be freely deciding not to exercise my free will. And Kant pointed this out, that we cannot escape the presupposition of free will. Now, that doesn't mean it's true. We don't know enough about how the brain works to know whether or not it's true. But we do know that it's unlike, if it's an illusion, it's unlike other illusions. Because if I think that color is an illusion... I can lead my life on the assumption, okay, these objects look colored, but they're not really colored. It's just an illusion that I have. But I can't in that way lead my life on the assumption that I don't have free will because whenever I make up my mind to do something, to choose among alternatives, I'm deciding, for example, who to vote for, who to vote or who to, uh, who, uh, what to order in a restaurant. In those cases, I have to presuppose that I genuinely have alternatives open to me. For example, as as an illusion, if I were a colour-blinded individual, I would look at a colour but be informed that it is another colour by someone else. So I take their word on it, but but it's an illusion. But at the same time, deciding to to talk to you right now or getting in my car in the next five minutes is obviously an aspect of free will that we may not know if that's deep down an illusion, but we still operate on the assumption that it's... it's an, if it's an illusion, it's one we cannot avoid. We can't shake it off. If you, insofar as you engage in rational decision making, mm. you have to presuppose freedom. 
Now, here's an odd uh, feature in 